Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. This week for Sketchbook Sunday, we are going to paint a cat using opaque watercolor on black watercolor paper. You can find the real-time version for this tutorial in Critique Club. If you're a member, it will be right there in the curriculum for you to click on and enjoy. If you're not a member and you'd like to be, it's $5 a month. You can upload up to two paintings a month for a customized critique from me so you can grow as an artist. There's prompts every month and there are two real-time tutorials for you to enjoy that are a little bit more on the intermediate to advanced side. So if you're looking to grow as an artist, please consider checking out Critique Club. I'll have a link in the video description to that and you can cancel any time. I'm starting off by sketching on this black watercolor paper, which was a gift from Denise for my birthday. I want to thank you so much. It was a lovely surprise and wonderful because I was planning on buying some of this anyway. So um, this way I could, uh, I didn't have to and I had it right away. So that was really fun. I'm using a piece of chalk. This is just a little um, like dressmaker's chalk holder. I'll see if I can find it uh, on Amazon and link it up. But um, it's, you know, you can use a white pastel pencil or just a piece of chalkboard chalk. Really doesn't matter. I like the skinny one just because I can get some detail. And I'm just drawing from a picture I'm looking at on my computer. It's a reference photo from Unsplash. And I'm trying to kind of uh, map out where I want my different shades of color. And if you're not that comfortable with drawing, you could print out the reference photo and trace it. And um, that would give you uh, kind of a little jump start there. So I wanted to use this black watercolor paper like I used white watercolor paper. The only difference being I'm using an opaque watercolor, AKA gouache, rather than using my traditional watercolors. And the colors I chose from this are all kind of in the pastel to mid-tone range. I do have um, a violet that's extremely dark and I plan to use black and white at the end if I need it. This way I will be staying within this um, kind of limited value range, but I will have kind of an ace in the hole that I could add to it later if I decide I need darker or brighter. So I wet the area of the chest and started dripping in paint. It didn't flow quite as well as I'd hoped. Now you're watching this sped up, so it looks like it flows great, but the paint really wasn't flowing that much. And that's kind of typical with uh, paints that have white added or opacifiers added, such as gouache. They don't tend to flow as much as watercolor because it's a more viscous paint uh, because it's more opaque. I also tried lifting like blotting just to see what I would get for texture. And I wasn't that impressed with that technique. I mean, it worked, but it just wasn't what I wanted for this. So I decided I would let that dry and revisit it later. So here I'm working on some dry paper and the brush I'm using is a Royal and Langnickel Fusion brush. I like this for, um, a gouache painting, I also like it for acrylics and oils. I do keep a separate set for oils so I don't end up bringing the oils into a water-based paint by accident, like, you know, residue. But they're really nice for pushing around a heavier body paint. And for this painting, I'm using any of my acrylic painting synthetic brushes because um, the gouache is just a little thicker than watercolor and um, it just takes a little bit more of a push than my um, than my watercolor brushes. I find that it might kind of wear down my softer watercolor brushes, but if you, all you have is watercolor brushes, just use the golden Taclon ones, which are the ones that have kind of like not soft black hair, but you know, more like blonde hair and they're going to work fine. It's basically the same thing. Uh, and so I'm just trying to go through and block in colors at this point. Um, anything I know I don't want to be really blendy, I'm going in. And this is a number eight round, so it's a fairly large brush, but it does come to a nice point. And these fusion brushes, you should be able to find them online at a lot of our art suppliers and Amazon, but you usually get the best bang for your buck if your big box art and craft store sells them. I know that um, AC Moore has them and they sell them in multi-packs of 10 for like 20 bucks and you can use coupons obviously, which is I think what I did here when I bought this set of rounds for gouache. Um, and they're just a nice brush. I for I like the rounds for gouache. I like uh, the small rounds for oil details. I have been able to wash them out just fine, um, but I don't use them for like, you know, the majority of my painting. I use them for like highlights and whatnot and oils. So just to, or for blending, you know, those final layers and, and what have you. Uh, I'm pretty much using this brush for most of everything. I am doing quite a bit of mixing because uh, for one thing, I do have to add some water to the paint. I'm not using it like full strength because it's pretty opaque even when you water it down. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but these are the Arteza gouache. These came from the 60 set 
and um, I kept the 60 set in tubes. I had the 24 set and I put that out in a permanent palette. I used a fish and tackle box. I have a video on how I um, dried down my paints in gouache so they don't like all crack and fall apart and make a mess. And that's how I typically like to use gouache. But for a, a piece like this where I wanted the paints to, I want to have the access to a lot of juicy paint. I, I just used it fresh from the tube. And with 60 colors, I really didn't want a palette with that many colors and it dried down. This way I would just squeeze out the colors that I need. Just take a little amount, a little goes a long way with this paint. And um, and you can let it dry on your palette and re-wet it if you're not done a painting. But I ended up just cleaning off my palette at the end. I didn't have that much left over, so it wasn't too bad. Now here I'm going in with some water and I'm softening some of the lines that I made because I really wasn't happy with all the marks. It was like too focusy. I wanted it less focusy. Um, as you got away from the face. And at this point, I've also made the face a little too fuzzy. It almost looks like a stuffed animal rather than a real cat. So I'm gonna have to fix that. Um, I think that as long as you're not too frustrated, it's better to fix a problem and push through it rather than just scrapping it and starting over. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm using a filbert brush with clear water and I'm scrubbing back because I had the face way too big. And then I'm just blotting straight down with a dry paper towel to lift away that extra paint and water. So lifting worked really well on this paper. This is again, the Stonehenge Aqua Black. It's that new 100% cotton black watercolor paper. Um, I don't know how much I will use this. I, I don't know if by the time I'm done this pad of paper, if I'll wanna run out and buy another one or if I'll be like, yeah, okay, that that was fun. That's uh, but um, but I'm good. <laughs> Uh, but it is fun and I'm I'm curious to experiment with taping it down, really soaking it and adding some colors to it. I might even use some like acrylic inks, um, you know, just to just to get something with a little bit more flow. Maybe even, uh, I'll have to see if my Bombay India inks are opaque. That might be kind of fun too. Definitely metallic inks would be really fun on this. Uh, I'm really I'm really open to, to experimenting with this, with different medias and seeing what I really enjoy. Um, so now that I've reshaped the face, I'm ha a little more happy with it. The cat is still a little too big and I'm gonna have to fix that at some point. I don't think at this point in the painting that it occurred to me that the cat was really out of proportion, but um, but it does at some point. And at this point, I'm probably about a half an hour in on the painting and just kind of plowing ahead. Now this fan brush does a nice job of showcasing the um, the parts in the fur. If you have a long haired cat, you've probably realized that their, their fur is like kind of fluffy and fuzzy and it will clump together and you'll get these like parts. And a fan brush is just perfect for illustrating that. Um, and this is probably like a Maine Coon cat. I have a, uh, a long haired cat. I think it's a Norwegian forest cat or something. I, I don't know, they're shelter cats. You always try to figure out what what kind of cat it is, you know, or what kind of what kind of animal it is when you get from a shelter because you're not exactly sure. Um, but as, hey, as long as they're healthy, that's, that's all I care about. Um, so, you know, being able to like observe a cat with long hair in real life, it can really help you when you go to paint it because you'll know how the light hits it and how the fur clumps and how it lays down and, and all of those little details that you might not realize if you, you know, don't have a cat. I'm using black to go in and refine some of the areas, get the pupil in, get some of the really dark shadows and the black furs in, and get those little dots that are on the muzzle where the whiskers come out of. It's a little extreme right now. I'm gonna have to soften that down, but um, I just wanted to kind of get my uh, get my bearings a little bit more because I had kind of lost my way a little bit there before I had to scrub back things. And um, I'm also using a thin down white for whiskers. I thought maybe I would use a pen um, or even a colored pencil, but I was just uh, excited to jump in and use the brush. This is a number two round that I'm using and it's got fairly, I wouldn't say it's got short bristles, it's probably a normal number two, but, um, but it's not like a liner or anything. You could use a liner if you prefer. The, you have to your paint pretty inky to use a liner, just keep that in mind. You can use it um, fairly full strength with just a little bit of water added if you're using a, just a regular round, which is what this is. Um, it's so funny because I don't typically buy small round brushes, but I always get them in the smart art boxes and then I always find them handy for projects like this. So, uh, so yeah, if you don't have any small round brushes, you might wanna grab a couple if you're gonna use gouache just because you need something that's a little bit firmer to uh, push it around on this, on this uh, dark paper. I think because the, the paper has a texture to it. It's a watercolor paper. So it's got that cold pressed texture, which could make a softer brush drag a little bit. And if you had the gouache really thin down, it would drag, you know, it, 
it would probably be too watery for you to even see the opacity. So here I'm fixing the uh, thickness of the cat. I'm just going in with a one inch flat and water and just scrubbing it out because I realized that, yep, I had the proportions way off and then just blotting it out. I didn't blot it, I didn't scrub it straight back to black because I knew I was going to put spatters there and I didn't really need to, so I figured I would save any wear and tear on the paper and um, I'm readjusting the collar. And the reason I decided to do lime green for the collar rather than the red that was in the reference photo is because of the green eyes. That way I could bring that in elsewhere on the painting and it wouldn't be just the eyes and nothing else. And I also, rather than just omit the co collar altogether, um, I felt like it needed the collar to explain why the fur indented at the back of the neck. And then it also gives you a hint of the actual frame of the cat rather than just the fur of the cat because um, the only places you really see the actual fur uh, uh, form of the cat would be the ears and the muzzle where the fur is really short and the collar where it's kind of um, uh, cinched in the fur a little bit. So I just feel like that helps give you a little more information about the animal that we're painting and um, the more information you can put in there accurately the better and then you can let other details kind of fuzz away. I wanted things to get less focused around as it got away from the face and then just kind of dissolve into spatters on the edge. I like um, I like it, I like to paint animals like that. I have quite a few animals that are painted in that fashion. I've got a flamingo, an owl, a ram, um, I have another cat that's painted like that. Uh, and I, I find that I just enjoy that a lot more than when I try to paint an animal that's really detailed for whatever reason, it's, I just enjoy it. So here I'm using some violet, which is you might think is a kind of a strange choice, but I did see a little bit of a violet tone in the lighting on the white fur of the cat, and I thought I'm gonna go with that because it's also an opposite color to that lime, yellowy lime green, that violet's pretty much across the color wheel, and it's gonna give you a little bit of a pop of color and look quite pleasing, I think. So just to make everything integrate, I'm spattering these colors into the background. And I wet some of that area where I'd scrubbed out the fur so that my colors could float and um, and blur because I, I felt that like that was a really um, interesting and um, pleasing effect. I liked it. Uh, plus I wanted, I really wanted a watercolor effect on this black paper. I wanted flow and I wanted, um, that, you know, that juiciness that, that you get with a watercolor painting. I want that looseness. That's probably the, the, a better way to describe it. But I also wanted some detail in the face. I want that contrast of detail and texture from the face to the blurry, flowy watercolor as it goes out to spatters. I really like spatters on this paper. I think that was really fun. Um, I think spattering metallic paint on this is a very good way to use this paper. In fact, I just came up with an idea as I was, as I'm, you know, recording this voiceover, I thought, what if I like took a big shape like a butterfly or a dragonfly and like just cut it out of contact paper or masking paper and put it down and then spattered all around it and then painted that, you know, the dragonfly or butterfly. I might have to try that next. I think that would be really cool. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Um, I think that would just be a fun way to, uh, you know, to take advantage of this paper. I'm t spending some time here on the eye because that's kind of the focal point, I think. Whenever you have an animal or a person, the eyes are what draws you in. Even though the cat's not looking at the viewer, I wanted to get that in. Also, the whiskers. I paid attention to the reference photo to get the whiskers uh, shaped and pointed accurately because um, they're not sticking out like you kind of would think of a, as a cat. They're just kind of relaxed and pointing downwards. So I wanted to make sure I had that pretty accurately. And I'm trying to get that nose color right. It's kind of like a really pale, orangey, salmon-y pink color. And um, I'm just trying to get the colors around the eye and the shape of the eye and the direction of the eye a little bit better. Um, the muzzle area with the little uh, kind of parts, little places where the whiskers come out of, I wanted to get that just enough of a detail to show what that is. And I'm just going in and adding some shading any place it needs it and kind of putting in the darks so that you have a little bit of a negative space around the lighter highlights so you can kind of see what you have for shapes and furs there. And then I'm doing my final details in color pencil and I'm using the Arteza pencils because I've been using the Arteza gouache and oftentimes when you work across a brand, their colors match and the color names do match and the colors do match pretty well across the brand in Arteza. And I hadn't done too much with our color pencils because I prefer the soft creaminess of Prismacolor pencils, but since I was working downstairs and I don't have my Prismacolors right there on my desk within reach, I decided I would grab those Arteza pencils. And I have to say, 
The white's more opaque than I remember it. I thought the white wasn't that opaque, but it's actually plenty opaque. I guess what I was thinking about this set of pencils not being very opaque, it's not that they're not opaque, it's that they don't have pastel colors. White is pretty much their only real pastel color. Uh, they do have some light grays and light creams and whatnot, but I really like Prismacolor for all the really pale pastels they have because I tend to work um, on top of paintings and it makes me a fashion and I like having that opacity of the pastel colors. Um, the Prismacolor's bright ones aren't really opaque um, and the Arteza range is definitely more of a bright range. It's more of a transparent bright range if you're if you're curious about those pencils. Um, they're usually quite a bit cheaper than Prismacolor so they're definitely a great option and if you work on white paper you're going to really like them and not want for any colors but if you're working on like black or anything that's more of like a mid-tone value, anything that's darker than like say a craft or a toned gray, you probably are going to want for some brighter colors, some, um, I'm sorry, more pastel colors. So just to kind of give you that information, they don't break as, as much as Prismacolors, which I like. The lead's a little bit firm, but they are still pretty creamy. So um, if that's what you're looking for in a pencil, you might want to give them a try. They're certainly a, uh, a bargain, I would say. And uh, just going in with some black pencil here as my final details to... Um, uh, to add shadow. I did add some white over the eye to give it that glassiness and you know that pretty much does it for this painting. I did end up going in afterwards and adding more splatter because I, I didn't like that big patch of black in the center of the cat's body. Uh, I felt like that needed to be covered up, disguised. I felt like it should be going more into spatter and to softness at that point. And, um, and I did that off camera at the end. So I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. If you want to see the real time version of this, check out Critique Club. I'll link that down below along with all the supplies I used if you're looking for any of those products. Thank you so much for watching today. Please give me a thumbs up before you go. Leave a comment. Until next time, happy crafting.